If life is extremely difficult for you and you are currently overwhelmed by your circumstances, this podcast today is for you. If you know someone who is overwhelmed by their circumstances, you will want to share this episode. Or maybe you just need to be inspired by someone who intentionally took steps to move forward and reinvent himself when his world fell apart around him. I suppose everyone wants to be happy in life. My guest will give you a different path to get there. He also explains that the stories you tell yourself are extremely important. You have only one life, and you own it. My guest today, as I end my first year of podcasting, and as we all get ready to kick off a brand new 2023, is Chad Foster. Chad lost his eyesight in his early 20s while a student at the University of Tennessee. But don't spend much time feeling sorry for Chad. As this episode begins streaming, Chad is bringing in the new year with his family snow skiing out west. Yep, the only blind downhill skier I ever knew. His blindness did not stop him from becoming an executive for Red Hat, the world's largest open source software company, and securing over $45 billion in contracts throughout his career. His blindness also did not stop him from positively influencing a ton of folks around the world. In fact, his blindness became a gift to him and a gift to all who have been impacted by him. Chad is the first blind graduate of the Harvard Business School Leadership Program and did what Oracle said could not be done. He built a software solution that created job opportunities for millions of people. In 2014, the University of Tennessee recognized Chad with the Accomplished Alumni Award. Chad is a high-impact international speaker, having spoken to leaders of such companies as Google, Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, GE, and Microsoft. He released his best-selling book, Blind Ambition, in 2021. Chad says happiness is not a feeling. Happiness is not an emotion. Happiness is a decision that each of us make every single day when we wake up. What a great way to kick off 2023. Viewing life from a hearse, it could be worse. Laugh, think, and cry with the country undertaker. This is Bruce Goddard, and you're listening again to the View from a Hearse podcast. I've got Chad Foster with me, who I just told you a little bit about. Hold on to your seats, folks. You're going to be inspired by what you're about to hear. Chad, you knew from birth that you had vision problems, but at some point where you were at University of Tennessee, you started realizing that you were losing your sight. So just kind of talk through that, if you would, and tell that story. Yeah, you know, they diagnosed me when I was young, three and a half years old, with an inherited eye disease. And it was sort of an, a, an invisible eye disease in my family, meaning nobody else in my family had any eyesight problems that we knew of. But I had problems seeing in really dimly lit situations, whether that be outside in the the pitch dark or in really dark rooms. So my parents took me to Duke University Medical Center when I was three years old. And it was there that they diagnosed me with retinitis pigmentosa, which is a rare inherited eye disease. And yeah, that was hard to imagine what my parents were going through as they drove home, knowing that their toddler in the back seat was at some point, per the doctor's uh, advice, you know, at some point the doctor said I would go blind or could go blind. And so that's a, it's gotta be a pretty Hmm. long drive home. Can't even imagine, yeah. Yeah, that's that's a tough one, right? It's a tough pill to swallow as a parent. I've got a six year old and a 14 year old and boy, I'd much rather be in my situation than be in my parents' situation having to cope with something like that. 
But, you know, the doctors told them they should take me home and sign me up for a special school for the blind. And my parents instead decided they were going to sign me up for soccer. (laughs) (laughs) So so they, they did. They put me in soccer, and I was pretty active. You know, I played all kinds of sports growing up. Played soccer, played football, played basketball, played baseball, wiffle ball. Anything I could do. Wrestled in high school. Right. But like you said, when I got to college, my eyesight started fading pretty pretty fast at about 18 or 19 years old. And that's when the darkness really began to, to set in. It's almost like if you've, ever, if you've ever tried to see through a really dense fog, <laughs> that's kind of what my vision was like. So at about 19, 20, 21 years old, this really dense fog began to set in and you know that was uh that was a tough period you know because it wasn't really although people had told me that i could go blind at some point it was just this really far out concept that i I couldn't really wrap my mind around you know every 16 17 year old is invincible nothing's going to happen to them i was no exception to that i thought i was invincible i thought everything was fine with me i was going to outrun this eye disease and not until college did the the reality hit me that you know what it is going to happen to me it looks like it's going to happen right now that was a really tough part is my self-image you know we ask kids all the time what do you want to be when you grow up and guess what none of them say they want to be blind none of them (laughs) so you were right in the middle of college when that happened right yeah, yeah, I was. I was going into the pre-medical field. I wanted to, to do something in medicine because I wanted to help other people. And then after going blind, you know, Bruce, I wasn't even sure if I could help myself. All right. So that was a pretty pretty tough period for me. A good year or two, I really struggled with what am I going to do? What What can I do? You know, a lot of people when they're trying to choose their field in life they have all options open to their disposal like what what can I dream of being it's pretty obvious I wasn't going to be an airline pilot you know or a neurosurgeon or you know not being able to see complicates that so I had to figure out what could I be and based upon that basket of professions what did I want to be and uh, in addition to all that just all the insecurities that come with going blind and becoming disabled and different expectations for you that people have when you step into the disabled world you know the unemployment rate for people with significant disabilities is over 70 percent in the united states i don't know if people know that or not but it's a very significant number of people with disabilities life-changing disabilities who can't find work even in the United States of America, where the unemployment rates, you know, between three and five, six percent, depending on which year we're in. I'm thinking as you're talking, tell me, so you went through a year or two devastated, but there was a point at some point you decided I'm going to get up and I'm going to do something. And you moved from victim to visionary. So tell me how how that happened how did you you were obviously anybody would be a victim at the beginning of that and you just said you were struggling why this happened to me what am i going to do but what who helped you what caused you to say you know what i've got to go on with life this is going to be my gift and not my curse yeah that process was it's it stretched out over some time. There were three three sort of events that I'll talk about to answer that question and, and really do it justice. The first was the tough love that I had from my dad growing up. Well, that was really tough to deal with growing up as I was going blind. You know, my dad gave me some straight talk about man to man, nobody really cares whether or not you can see or not. Hmm. And that's pretty hard to hear but I think there's a lot of truth to that. Whether or not I could I could find legitimate reasons to fail at what I wanted in my life wasn't really my focal point. You know, I, I really developed a mindset that you know, if I was gonna sit around and feel sorry for myself for the rest of my life at, at 20 years old, you know, another 50 or 60 years of feeling sorry for myself is way too much sorry for me to live with. So that was, uh, 
that was a, a reality that that struck home for me. And then I had a really, really, uh, I, I'd call it inflection point, I guess you'd say, when I went to Leader Dogs for the Blind to get my first guide dog. So I show up to Leader Dogs for the Blind to get my first guide dog. I'm 23 years old, Bruce. I roll on campus there in Rochester Hills, Michigan, to get my first guide dog at Leader Dogs for the Blind. His name was Mile, great German Shepherd. And I roll in there with this, really, this victim mentality, this poor me mentality. Here I am, I'm 23 years old, and I went blind. And <laughs> really just sort of looking at the cup half empty. And I started re realizing the people around me, some of them were facing far greater adversity and had far fewer blessings than I had. Right. Some of them had mental impairments in addition to being blind. Some of them were on dialysis because they had diabetes right. on top of being blind. And there were these girls there that we, we were with every single day who were deaf and blind. And these girls, like the rest of us there, were getting a dog so that they could walk around independently. Now, look, it's one thing when you just meet someone on the street and you hear how rough they have it. But when you live with someone for a month hmm. and you see their challenges firsthand, it really etches it into your memory. It really changes you. And it changed me. It helped me understand that happiness, you know, a lot of people think it's a feeling. Well, it's not. Happiness is not a feeling. And it's not an emotion. It's a decision that you make every single day when you wake up. It's a perspective that you take when you take your head off the pillow and plant your feet on the floor. How will you choose to look at your life? Are the things that you lack or the blessings that you've been given that we all really naturally take for granted? I think all of us fall into that. We take things for granted until we can't anymore. I certainly did that with the, the eyesight that I had had. I'd taken my my eyesight for granted even though it wasn't perfect until it was gone and i couldn't take it for granted anymore and i sure didn't want to let that happen with my hearing or my kidney function or my mental capacity and so that was a real life-changing moment for me and i returned back to the university of tennessee at that point with a new outlook on life you know i had to relearn how to learn and it turns out i was a better blind student than sighted student I ended up <laughs> making straight A's, made the Dean's List for the first time, and then I went on to, to work for a top consulting firm. So truth, maybe I should have gone blind sooner. But I went on throughout my career, and this is the, sort of the third experience that I mentioned to you that, right. that really reshaped it, how I turned it into a gift. And it was, you know, I was about 15 years into my career. I was a senior director at a large technology services company and i was leading our pricing strategy and solutions group up there and at the time you know, we were working on these very large technology proposals and my decisions and strategies had brought in over 45 billion dollars in contracts for the company so i was doing pretty good at my job my company realized it and they said you know what chad you've helped us so much we want to do something for you what can we do for you and for some crazy reason i said hey won't you send me to harvard and for some crazier reason they said okay so they decided to to sponsor me going to harvard business school and when i was there i was studying in a class with professor per, excuse me professor bill george and for those of of you who don't know who Bill George is, he's an executive fellow at Harvard Business School. He's a former chair and CEO of Medtronic, one of the world's largest medical supply companies, <laughs> really phenomenal leader. And as he's talking about authentic leadership, one of the principles that he teaches is how to discover your true north. And we were reading his book entitled just that, Discovering Your True North. And a lot of it has to do with how do you take adversity, trauma, struggle in your life and use it as a, an opportunity to kind of crosswalk what have you struggled with versus what do you have some talent with and how can you take something and turn it into a profession? And a lot of my classmates were grappling with what they could do 
in their lives and mine just sort of reached up and smacked me in the face i i was sitting there and it became so obvious to me that i'd never really tried to do anything with my personal story i'd always i've done well in business and i i had people tell me from time to time that i was inspiring but i never really tried to do anything with it and it was there that those seeds were sown and then i was my classmates elected me to speak at our graduation and so I, I took the time and went to Houston and met with a consultant. And before I'd even been nominated or elected as the speaker, I went and worked on a 12 minute talk because I just knew it was supposed to happen. I just felt it in my bones, in my soul. And uh, so I went, went back to Boston. Sure enough, I was, I was nominated and then elected to speak at graduation. And for the first time in my life, I tried to help somebody with the story that I have, the, the lessons I've been through. And it, it really, it blew them away, but it blew me away because I didn't realize, number one, how much I could help, but number two, how good it would feel by helping somebody with what I've been through. You know, the feeling I got, and I'll, I'll tell you a couple of examples of what people said to me, but hmm. you know, it, it, it sort of made going blind worth it, which is a, a kind of a bizarre thought to have for the first time and just to think that you can go through something so traumatic but by helping other people with the struggle that you've been through it assigns new meaning to it it assigns new value to it and i realized that it becomes your gift yes right? yeah exactly and, and now that's how I, I refer to blindness as the beautiful gift that came disguised in some really ugly wrapping paper you know i've talked to a lot of people that have gone through a couple of people with blindness, but other stuff as well. And and what you're saying is a common theme. One, this the the tough love that you received from your parents. There's a lesson there. The the reality that you you start looking that other people have it worse than you. You don't have it worse than everybody else. There's other people in a worse situation than you. And then that you take what you're going through and turn it into a to start helping other people. Uh, I, I, that is a common theme, isn't it? I mean, isn't that amazing? I think that's what I just heard you say, basically, those three things, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it's, you know, you're moving beyond yourself. I'm moving beyond myself. I'm not focused on me. I realized at that point in my life, you know, I was going to be okay. My kids are going to be okay. They're going to go to the schools. I had been so self-involved in my career and wanting to, to make it to XYZ, job titles and, and income levels and all that. And then I realized after I gave that talk at Harvard and, you know, one guy comes up to me and he's, he's literally breaks down in my arms because come to find out he had lost a daughter the year before to cancer. Right. And Bruce, I'm not like, a, I, I, I'm not a real soft and fuzzy person. That's not who I am by nature. But when you have an experience like that, with a parent that you can reach in that way, who's gone through that experience, it changes you, brother. It, yeah. it absolutely changes you. It, it, it melts you, and it right. it definitely melted me and showed me that I needed to move beyond myself because there was an opportunity to do something a whole lot bigger than you know money or job titles or any of that. It, it would have a real difference to make a real difference in, in the lives of people, and so that's really. That's motivating to me. It's uh, it's one thing to make profits, but you know we all need to make money to you know, put food on the table. But when you can tie your profession and your profits to your purpose, to your meaning, to your why, that's where you find that extra motivation, right? All of a sudden, it's it's not a it's not a job. It's a reason for being on the planet. It's a why. From that speech, you you spoke to the biggest companies in the world, all over the world, really, right? I mean, you've had a lot of opportunities to tell your story. Yeah, yeah, I have. I've been very fortunate. My book was published last year with HarperCollins Leadership, Blind Ambition. I have spoken to Google. I have spoken to you know, Red Hat, IBM. Um, I've spoken to Salesforce, I've spoken to Tableau big technology companies. I've spoken at, at Harvard, obviously. Uh, uh, lots of big pharmaceutical companies. And yeah, I've been very fortunate to, to share that message now that I think is really important, whether, you know, whether or not you're going, you're going through what I went through, 
not everybody goes blind, but everybody's going through something. Right. And that something is significant to them. You know, our ability to navigate whatever adversity we face in our lives is based upon whatever adversity we've been exposed to at that point in our lives. And so our ability to be resilient is predicated on what we've been through. And so, you know, not everybody's going through what I've been through, but everybody's dealing with something. And so what I want to do is help people navigate that something. So I talk a lot about the right mindset that it takes to navigate those circumstances and, and demonstrate resilience. I also talk about, you know, diversity and things like that. But my, my core message, my passion really is helping people understand how to cultivate a resilient mindset in the face of what can seem like overwhelming obstacles and, and deal with changes more productively. Yeah, everybody's going through some, something and you have no idea what they're going through and you have no idea uh, who could be inspired by by what you're going through and how you've attacked what you're going through. Folks, the book is called Blind Ambition. He didn't come on here to sell his book, but I want to tell you, I'm looking at it. I've held it in my hand. Chad E. Foster, you can find this book anywhere go to amazon or you can download it you can order it how to go from victim to visionary and if you're going through a tough spot in life and you feel overwhelmed and you're worried about how you're going to put your next step in front of the other this is the book you need to get to this is chad foster that we're talking to chad one of the things that touched me i, I was reading about your guide dogs my wife and I, I retired in 2021, and we, we, we've got us a little dog, and he's like a person. And I just had my heartstrings pulled by your attachments. Number one, the, the, how smart those dogs are, but the attachments when you have to give one up and they don't work out or they, they get beyond their usefulness. And talk a little bit about that. That was just a powerful part that I read last night. Oh, it's tough, Bruce. Man, it's tough. Yeah, you definitely get attached to them. You know, the, a lot of, what a lot of people don't understand is that, number one, these dogs don't come from the school uh, 100% ready to rock and roll. You know, they don't roll off of some magical assembly line ready to do everything you need them to do. And so you have to, you have to teach them to do the things that you need them to do. Now they understand the basics, the blocking and tackling, if you will. They understand left from right. And they understand to generally speaking, avoid obstacles and to, to stop at curbs and things like that. But I had to teach, I have to teach them how to find me an open chair, how to find me an escalator, how to find me an elevator, how to find me a crosswalk, the difference between upstairs and downstairs, and how to help, help me navigate Atlanta Hartsville Jackson Airport and so there's a lot of teaching unbelievable that that's involved there and when you when you teach a dog when you're involved like that it takes a really really strong bond you know the dogs just to dispel another misconception the dogs don't magically know when I got to go to Hartsville Jackson Airport if I got to go to gate A16 my dog doesn't know where gate A16 is so it's teamwork. I've got to direct the dog when to go left, when to go right, when to look for an escalator, when to stop, when to, you know, really it's like he's point to point navigation and I am sort of the, the navigator with the mapping system. And it, it's, it's teamwork, right? It's right. all about teamwork. And with that teamwork is the bond. And the only reason, there are like a couple of reasons why the dog really wants to work for you. Number one, is love the dog wants to work for you because of the love and so that that's a really really important ingredient to a working dog relationship the second thing is it has to be fun and if it's not fun then the dog won't want to work you know it, it, it's kind of like our jobs right if we're having fun when we're working it's great to go to work if it feels like a grind then you know we're not as interested in doing it dogs are no different than that absolutely and then the and then the third thing is the, the sort of the mutual respect. And so the dog has to know there are certain things that are completely out of bounds. Can't do that. For example, you know, respecting traffic flow, pretty important thing to keep us both alive. And so you add all those three ingredients up, you've got this really strong bond of love, of mutual respect and of, of playfulness. 
<laughs> and you're with one another 100% of the time. Every meeting I went to, the dog was there. Every business trip, the dog was there. Every vacation, it's me and my buddy. And so I, I really feel fortunate. I get to take my best friend with me everywhere I go. And so they're they're definitely a member of the family. When that time comes to have to switch gears and and, and either put them on the bench or you know when the, when the health no longer is holding up, it's a it's it's a rough it's a rough time. It's a hard transition, natural cycle of life. But it's a it's a bond not like a lot of people get to experience just because of the closeness that's involved and the the reliance on on one another that that we have. Yeah, I. I... I was just touched by that. How many dogs have you had, Chad? I've technically had six. Three of them did not work out. I've had three long-term partners, including my current partner, Sarge. And so Sarge is a, is a German Shepherd, right? I, I read where you you went to uh, lab lab for a short period of time, right? But you went back to the yeah. German Shepherd, yeah. I tried having a Labrador for my second one because I wore dark suits all the time. And I thought, if you can't beat the hair, join the hair. So I got a black lab. <laughs> right. And uh, at least the hair would blend in. But after six months, he didn't work out. So I thought, you know what? Br bring me the, the hair, and I'll just get a better brush, you know, and a lint roller. <laughs> keep my suits clean. <laughs> well, that was a good digression. It's just, it just you put it in the book, and it, it touched me. I just, we got a wonderful dog. And it's, uh, I can see how that would, your dependence on the dog and, the dog's dependence on you is a wonderful story. So another thing you talk about, you don't have a lot of patience for people who make excuses because things didn't go their way. In fact, you say in your book, excuses are for losers. Yeah. Just talk about that a little bit because I know it's so easy for us when, when we have a bump in the road to start blaming everybody else or something else instead of just taking on whatever's going on. Yeah, it is. It is a passion of mine, and I, I, I fell, I fell victim to it at first too. You know, when I first went blind, I, I was making excuses and how it was harder. You know, to use my, just even to use a computer. Um, not everything worked with my software that I had on my computer. But then I realized, you know what? If my software didn't work with whatever I needed it to work with in the office, and I got. I got. Uh, I couldn't do my job. Then who's going to end up losing at the end of the day? I am. So I, I ended up teaching myself how to write code to engineer that software, so that I didn't have to rely on other people. And I, I wonder, you know, how helpful is it in our lives if we find an excuse to lose? Or another way to say it is, if we find a legitimate reason to fail. Who wants to find a legitimate reason to fail? And even if you find a legitimate reason to fail, how does that help you? You know, at the end of your life, when you look back on your life, how will you feel if you don't get what you want out of your life? Is it better to comfort yourself in the moment with an excuse? Or is it better to hold yourself accountable so that you can move towards your goals and your dreams? None of us are responsible for all of our circumstances, but every single one of us have got to be accountable for our lives and our outcomes. At the end of the day, this is my life. So I've got to own it. Right. And that's your life. You've got to own it. If you don't own your life, who's going to? That's true. Very, very true. I view life from a hearse, Chad. And that is the message. You've got one life. I, I view it with the end in mind. And it's, and it's okay to fail along the way. In fact, you will fail sure. along the way. That's, that's, yeah. that, that you got to take the shot, but, but, yeah. but you learn and you get better when you fail, but yeah. you can't live your life being afraid to lose. You would have never, never created that code or written that code. And, and by the way, you, you wrote a, a program for uh, a CRM, which is a customer relations management program that that created what millions of jobs for people that could so they could use this pro this software when they can't see, right? Yeah, Oracle owned the software, and they they didn't think it could be done. The manufacturer of the screen reading 
technology, the software vendor didn't think it could be done, but I had already done it. I had a client on the call with Oracle and the screen reading software vendor, and they, they had a, an employee who'd been using my code for a year. And so from that point forward, Oracle, you know, multi-billion dollar ERP, enterprise resource planning technology company out of Silicon Valley, started sending business my way. <laughs> so... Yeah, I was I was called to testify in a couple of a case um, because they didn't think it. You know, te- technically speaking, it wasn't supposed to be able to be done, but I had uh, I had already done it. I'd, I'd figured out a way to do it, kind of with my eyes closed. You know, <laughs> so <laughs> you it's just and that's another thing just, I read. You 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 don't mind throwing the humor in with all this, and I I've learned that laughter gotta, laughter to, laughter is good medicine, brother. I guarantee you that. Yes, yeah. sir. I, I, yeah. I think it's a big part of why I am where I am. I take my job seriously, and I want to be excellent at everything that I do. But I don't take my situation so seriously that I can't have fun with it. You know, you know this better than I. Nobody is getting out of this thing we call life alive. So we've got to have fun while we're here. You know, we've got to have some fun. I want to work hard, but I want to laugh. I want to have fun. And I don't take my situation so seriously that I can't laugh about it. And I think that that helps me disarm people, you know, when I'm, whether I'm in the boardroom or on the main stage giving a talk, I use a lot of humor because I realize humor disarms people. It makes me able to relate with people. It shows them that, you know what, I'm comfortable in my situation so they can be comfortable too. They don't have to worry about the words they choose or anything like that. We can just have a conversation. Everybody can be comfortable nobody needs to walk on eggshells they can just be who they are and we can meet in conversation that way wow unbelievable i mean this is a guy folks all his life was told he was going to be blind he didn't really believe it but it happened and now you see and uh what he is doing with his life and most of the people listening to this are not blind and some will be but most of you are going through something and the the end product is what he's saying. Your life is yours. And he couldn't control being blind, but he could control how he how he reacted, uh, responded to being blind. And what a what an amazing story, Chad. If you've got uh, just a message for people, just from your heart, that are listening to this, that their heart is beating fast as they hear your story, because they are they're thinking. I'm hovering in the ditch and I need to get up and move on with life. What would you tell them? I would say the single most important thing that you can do, if you were to choose one thing to take away from this, it's to be very intentional about the stories you choose to tell yourself. And what I mean by that is there's choice there. There's power and choice. You have the power to choose your story. And it's the stories you tell yourself about you and your circumstances that will determine how you end up in your life. You can choose to tell yourself a story of poor me. Hmm. Or you can choose to tell yourself a different story. A better story. Now, for me, I, you know, in my situation, I could have chosen to tell myself that I went blind because I've got terrible luck. And that might have been one technically true story. Instead, I chose to tell myself that I went blind because I'm one of the very few people on this planet who has the strength and toughness to overcome it and use it to help other people. Now, technically, both of those stories could be true, but the first story paints me as a victim but the second story the better story is a jedi mind trick that transforms my disability into my strength i went blind because i'm strong enough to deal with it which means i'm strong enough to deal with all of the other curveballs that life throws me so i went blind and i decided to tell myself that i could suck that up and take it while helping other people but You don't have to go blind to use this tool. Anyone can make the decision to tell themselves a better story. You get to decide your story. The facts of our situation are far less important 
and the stories we tell ourselves. And so if both your stories are true, why wouldn't you choose the better story? Because at the end of our lives, Bruce, I promise you this, every single one of us will become our stories. So choose your stories wisely. Wow. Folks, this is Chad Foster. Uh, the book is Blind Ambition. You can go get it. You can order it. Chad, thank you so much. I, I have a feeling that we could talk for several hours with the stuff coming out of you. Uh, what inspiration. Thank you, my friend. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you for my joining pleasure. me. Thank you very much. It could be worse Laugh, think, and cry With the country undertaker